Happy Sabbath and uh, uh, welcome to our number five in the presentation of uh, the prophets. And uh, I'm glad that the Lord has been able to lead us all through the week and still give us a good health, uh, an environment and atmosphere that is uh, conducive for studying and uh, communing with one another through this platform. And so today we are in number five in the series of the prophets and uh, we are going to look at um, the interpretation of LNG white writings. And so shall we be able to pray and then uh, we proceed. Our Father, thou art our God, and uh, we thank you for the Sabbath rest, the twofold blessing that you want to give unto us. And uh, in this hour, may you commune with us and help us to understand the things that uh, we are going to speak about and help us to make decisions, Lord, to follow Jesus Christ and not after cunning our fables. Your will on earth be done as it is in heaven, in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, in the previous presentation, we looked at the lesser light and um, how do we relate with the non-canonical writers. And uh, a Seventh-day Adventist, we believe that uh, E.G. White was a messenger of the Lord. And so I just want to look at um, how we do the interpretations of uh, her materials. And I hope this will be a blessing to us. Just uh, on a start, uh, E.G. White herself was uh, born in... Uh, 1827 and uh, rested in 1915. And uh, she was among the founding or um, the pioneers of the Advent movement during the Great Disappointment. Uh, and she contributed so much to shaping and uh, guiding in uh, uh, the beliefs of Seventh-day Adventists. Now, what are the different ways to use a text before we even look into the E.G. White materials? When uh, we are studying the Bible, there are three ways we can look at uh, the material that is exegetically and uh, number two, homili uh, homiletically and uh, theologically. In exegesis, this is um, how we look at the text that um, we are trying to understand when we are reading the scriptures. Exegesis is concerned with the original meaning of a text the exegetical use of scripture therefore focuses on what the text meant to the original uh, reader. When to use a text theological means to see the implication the text has for the larger theological scheme based on scripture as a whole. And what will be the formation or system of belief when you come up with the meaning of the text. How will it impact you? How will it uh, affect your response uh, to the thing that you're reading? In Psalm uh, 22 verse 1, a psalm of David, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and who and from the words of my groanings? Now, exegetically, Psalms 22 refers to David's persecution through Saul in 1 Psalm 23 verse 25. 
typologically it refers to Christ and his experience in Matthew chapter 27 verse 46. David is a type of Christ. Three, to use a text homiletically means to apply the language of a text to a modern present situation. And so the examples in Mark 1 15, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Two, in Mark 2 17, Jesus says to Simon and Andrew, follow me and I'll make you uh, become fishers of men. And so uh, when you're using the text uh, in a homiletical uh, way, then uh, how will you apply that to the present day situation? And uh, it more so deals with the, uh, the interpretation and the spiritual aspect and the realities of the text that uh, you are really looking at. Now, Ellen White's, Ellen White's use of scripture in Great Controversy 675, she says, those who accept the teaching of God's word will not be wholly ignorant concerning the heavenly abode. And yet I have not seen or ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Quoting 1 Corinthians 2.9. Human language is inadequate to describe the reward of the righteous. It will be known only to those who behold it. No finite mind can comprehend the glory of the paradise of God. 1 Corinthians 2, 1, 10. And brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power that year your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And so, however, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory which which none of the rulers of this age knew for he had they known they will not have crucified the lord of glory but as it is written i has not seen nor ear heard nor has entered into the heart of man the things which god has prepared for those who love him but god has revealed them to us through his spirit for the spirit searcheth all things yes the deep things of god now in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7 to 9, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin according to the riches of his grace, which he had, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself. 1 Timothy, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God has manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed in the world, received in glory and so the spirit of the prophets is subject to the prophets and so the very same spirit that inspired the writers to write about the mysteries of god we see that it should be able to guide anyone including eg white uh, to speak of those mysteries in the same way that uh, those who were before her or him spoke. And the prophet builds upon prophets. Messengers build upon messengers. There is no messenger who will come and distort the text completely to mean something else that uh, the original writer intended it to mean. For we see that the text can be understood in... Um, uh, exegetical way, homiletical way, and theological way. And in these three spheres, the non-canonical messengers of God have to consider 
as they are building upon those who are canonical, um, what they really meant to the congregation of that time, what are the theological messages they were passing to the people at that time, and um, when those messages are brought to a greater Christendom, how do they apply uh, to the lives of the people then? And so the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophet. It means that it builds on them and they don't bring something anew to the people, but it is the old light shining in a new way. Uh, and so... Uh, Now, in uh, the truth which Peter had confessed in the foundation of the believers uh, is the foundation of believers' faith. It is that which Christ himself has declared to be eternal life. But the possession of this knowledge was no ground for self-glorification. Through no wisdom or goodness of his own had it been revealed to Peter. Never can humanity of itself attain to knowledge of the divine. It is a high, uh, it's as high as heaven. What canst thou do? Deeper than hell, what canst thou know? Now, another thing that should be considered when uh, we are um, looking at the canonical, the non-canonical prophet and the, in the, their interpretation of uh, what they are saying or trying to understand what they are saying, it is to look at uh, the writers of the Bible, do the things that they speak, really uh, 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 much as hand and glove or it is something wholly uh, different from what uh, is revealed in the Bible and that is what uh, uh, I say that um, we have to consider what are these people speaking about that uh, does it match with what is written because the spirit doesn't bring everything or anything anew but that which is in the scripture it amplifies and so when uh, we are looking at the eg white materials our burden is we should be acquainted with the scriptures understand them first for ourselves and then see if her writings really correspond with what is in the scriptures. That is how to interpret E.G. White. And uh, the Bible is not subject to E.G. White. E.G. White is the subject to the Bible. And so, uh, the burden of those who read her material is uh, to see, is she quoting the same Bible because the non-canonical messenger of God has to quote the Bible. They don't have to bring something that is not in the Bible, but they have to bring what is in the uh, Bible and uh, uh, they will be uh, tested by the scriptures to the law. If they do not speak according to this word, there's no truth in them. And so she is not immune to be subjected to the Bible or um, to be examined by the Bible. Sometimes um, you see the pitfall that we enter in is that uh, we put her writing on the forefront and say that uh, they are on the equal footing with the Bible. Now, that's, that, that has been uh, a lot of uh, contention about that. Are the writings of E.G. White equal to the Bible? Are they the Bible or what is it? And uh, we have heard about her biographies and even letters. Should they, they be included in inspiration or not in inspiration? And uh, there are so much to talk about that. And so we are looking at the principles of uh, interpretation and uh, how shall we understand the Bible and sh how shall we understand her um, uh, writing actually now when uh, just the same way we look at the interpretation of the bible and uh, know that this text applied to these people at a certain time this is what they were going through and um, this is how they responded this is what god wanted them to achieve 
the same way we have to subject the materials of non-canonical writers to. Uh, and uh, I'll just go through something uh, when uh, looking at this. One thing is consider time and place. Consider time and place. And so um, there are times when Greek and Latin scholars are needed. Some must study these languages. This is well, but not all and not many should study them. Those who think that a knowledge of Greek and Latin is essential to higher education cannot see a far off. So time and place should be considered. Um, and then uh, what else? Uh, number two, look at the immediate context. Look at the immediate context. What is the context of the issue? Uh, what was happening? Who was being addressed? What is the person? What was the person doing? And can I find myself the thing that was written for that person applying to me? The context will determine if the same thing is to be carried universally or it was a specific matter being addressed to a specific person which has no bearing to the reader but just wanting to know that how would God respond to the people when they are behaving like this and that and uh, how will he respond to me another issue uh, is number three you study the larger context and that is uh, how does the whole issue come to apply either to individuals at such a time that we are living in or at the church uh, that uh, at the time that uh, we are in. And so the, the, these are the issues we, we should look at uh, when uh, we are looking at uh, E.G. White's material and how to understand them. Again, something else also to consider while looking at the Bible and E.G. White material because we are looking at how do you interpret them. Look for principles. Look for principles. And when I say look for principles, <clears throat> you know, even the Bible itself, there are some times where it lacks specifics. But it brings to us a larger principle that we can derive uh, specifics uh, from. And so when you look at the principles, the general principles, uh, and uh, think about like this, that uh, in ancient, they didn't have to, in the wilderness, they didn't have to light fire in the wilderness. And it was because of the climate at that point. Now, what what kind of principle can we drive from this? Uh, is it the whole issue of not lighting the fire on the Sabbath or there is some um, a principle that we should derive from this that uh, on the Sabbath day, there are things that we have to refrain from because they can cause something that uh, will uh, be abundant in handling during the Sabbath hours. This is the principle in not lighting the fire on the Sabbath. Uh, I know we, we have a lot to say on this about lighting the fire on the Sabbath. And so the general principle is that will you engage yourself in an activity if um, something happens that it will uh, destroy the whole sanctity of the Sabbath or it will consume your time instead of uh, worshiping the Lord in the spirit and the truth, you will be now your mind drifted off from um, the real thing that uh, you should be doing. And so look for principles. They are not always specific. Um, uh, and the Bible doesn't always give the specifics. And so when also we are reading uh, the the E.G. White material, take for example this. There's a time she said that owning a bike was so expensive. Now you look at the general tenor of the statement that owning a bike was expensive and you ask yourself, you look at today, uh, is really owning a bicycle expensive? Just a simple bicycle where actually uh, around um, 
let me say $70, you can get a bicycle. But at that time, the owning a bicycle was a very expensive uh, adventure. It was something so expensive. And so uh, while she was talking to the general conference uh, in 1897, she told them that uh, the money expended in bicycles and dress and other needless things must be counted for, accounted for. As God's people, you should represent Jesus, but Christ is ashamed of the self-indulgent ones. My heart is pain. I can scarcely restrain my feelings when I think how easily our people are led away from practical Christian principles to self-pleasing. And so there was this craze of uh, buying the bicycle during the time of 1897. And people were not buying it per se for the sake of the work, but it became a pleasure thing. We are looking at the principles now, not the specifics. And so the specific is not that you should not buy a bike. We are looking at the greater principle. Why not buy the bicycle or why have the bicycle? The reason of having the bicycle was the most important thing. And then uh, uh, she had this address to the General Conference Bulletin. By the way, at that time, the bicycle was going at uh, 125 US dollars. And... Uh, you know, you may think that $70 at this time and $125 at this time, uh, it is a difference of uh, around uh, $55. And you may say that is not too much a difference then and now. But uh, this is what you should understand. The dollar at that time was um, of great value than um, right now. And so it was an expensive affair owning a bicycle and more so when it was only for pleasure seeking and owning it for the sake that others had the bicycle. And so uh, we, we, we have to look at the greater principle while actually we are um, reading the Bible and interpreting E.G. White material. Think about the Bible says that... Um, uh, we shall not eat meat. And uh, you look at the greater principle why actually we should not eat meat. Uh, this is uh, uh, something also that has to be explored. Uh, why actually the Bible has a principle. This is a health principle. It doesn't go into specifics. We have to derive, derive the specifics for ourselves. Why not this and why this? And uh, why does the Bible say this? And why does this writer say this? So, Another thing, uh, the prophets actually grow also as even that just Christian grow because they are also human beings. They are also human beings and growing into the truth. The prophet is not immune to Christian growth and understanding the matter. Take an example of Daniel chapter um, Eight and the prophet Daniel, where he is shown the 2300 days, the Mare, the inner shrine prophecy. And he understood that the vision that had been given to Jeremiah, or the years that had been given to Jeremiah for the captivity of Israel in Second Chronicles was 70 years of captivity, but now he's given another number and uh, he was appalled by the vision and did not understand it. It is not always that the prophet will understand their material. And this point is a very important point because um, I was conversing with a brother and we were thinking, did E.G. White really understand the impact of her writings, even herself? Remember, at the time that uh, Adventism was re-emerging, because Adventism has been there since uh, the book of Genesis, when man sin, when Adam sin, immediately there was Adventism that is uh, looking forward to the coming of Jesus Christ to save uh, the people from uh, the presence of sin. First of all, to save them from sin and then from the presence of sin. So there was Adventism um, from uh, Genesis chapter 3. Already before sin, we had seventh day, uh, 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 seventh day worshippers or Sabbath keepers, I may say, sorry. 
Sabbath keepers. They were there before sin because Adam and Eve were keeping the Sabbath. But then Adventism started immediately after sin. They hoped for the coming of Christ to save us from, um, uh, from the presence of sin. Remember the prophecy in the book of Genesis that uh, uh, there shall be a war between the seed of the serpent and the seed of a woman. And so from that very first prophecy, there was Adventism there. Now, when it was re-emerging in uh, 1840s, we find that um, um, E.G. White, as one of the people who are there in the pioneers of the movement, says that her mind was locked and she did not understand the thing until the doctrine was able to be understood by the other pioneers. So her mind was locked. Now, the question that we should ask ourselves, were her mind unlocked fully, even after this brethren coming to the understanding of the truth, and did they have all the truth? And we found out in the previous presentation that um, we cannot take a position that we have all truth as a people. Light shall continue unfolding. And so we cannot presume all E.G. White wrote is the totality of the truth. And if what she wrote was the totality of truth, did also her self understand and understand everything she wrote? It won't be a sin and it won't be blasphemy to say that E.G. White did not understand everything she wrote or she did not understand the impact of everything that she wrote. Because even in canonical writers, we find that they did not understand everything they wrote. And one example is Daniel the prophet, who was so beloved by God, but did not understand everything. Peter, when he asked Jesus Christ, will this prophet not die? Christ told him, what is, is it to you? If I want him to live until such and such, what is it to you? And so Peter never understood everything that either Christ spoke or he himself uh, asked about. Also, um, who else can I speak of? Uh, John the Revelator. Although we hear that the book of Revelation is unsealed uh, or a revelation or uh, a book to help us understand Daniel, but we ask ourselves, did they understand everything that they wrote? And if they understood everything they wrote, why not just be in plain? Why do we need again the spirit to guide us into all truth? Because in the book of John chapter 16, we are told how between the spirit come, he shall guide you into all truth. Meaning, even though the prophets wrote the truth, but God will continue unsealing the truth. Take an example of what E.G. White talks about, even about herself. On this issue, she, she didn't understand everything she wrote. And uh, look at 60, page 17, paragraph 1. Uh, the light we have received upon the third angel's message is the true light. This is her self-writing. The mark of the beast is exactly what it has been proclaimed to be. Not all in regard in this matter is yet understood, nor will it be understood until the unrolling of the scroll. But a most solemn work is to be accomplished in our world. The Lord's command to his servant is cry aloud and spare not lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgression in the house of Jacob their sins. And uh, so that is, um, I was reading from uh, 60, sorry. I have just projected and, and read it. The light we have received upon the third angel's message is the true light. The mark of the beast is exactly what it has been proclaimed to be, and uh, we understand is Sunday sacredness. Not all in regard to this matter is yet understood, nor will it be understood until the unrolling of the scroll, but a more solemn work is to be accomplished in our world. So even though E.G. White herself wrote a lot about um, the mark of the beast, the image of the beast, and the number of the beast, there may be a probability that in her writing there are things that she wrote and will not be understood until the unrolling of the scroll. Even in the Bible, there are things which have been uh, spoken by the prophet. They never understood them. And the spirit, how between the spirit comes, he shall um, guide us into all truth. And so 
as we look at the interpretation of EG white writings, we have to have this in mind that uh, there are things, although even she wrote, she never explained them uh, into their totality. And as we continue growing closer to Christ and even come to the point of the loud cry and the latter rain, there shall be more unfolding of the truth, not different from the Bible, not different from non-canonical writers who have been inspired, but um, the light shining in a greater way that those who lived at that time understood the things in the context of their time and according to the things that were happening. But then uh, in our time, we can be able to understand the same thing, not uh, oppositely from what they understood, but with added information and added light. And so uh, it is not um, a, a, a drawing back and uh, belittling the ministry of uh, biblical writers who are canonical and the messengers of God who are non-canonical to say that they never understood everything they wrote. And so uh, we have to be careful when uh, we read something and we say, because so and so reached here in their understanding, that is the totality of the understanding of the thing. But God is going to add more light or shine the old light in a more brighter way. And uh, uh, we have to be studious. We have to accept uh, that uh, God will work in a way that uh, is uh, beyond uh, our human imagination. And so th that is what I like to say about um, uh, prophets growing, the messengers of growing, growing also in the light. And so we saw that um, Daniel never understood the Mare, the 2300 days. And even at the time of his sleeping, it was sealed unto him because it had no bearing in his time. But it had a bearing in our time. And so it is only the people living in the time that that vision shall be fulfilled that are um, profited by the understanding of the vision and uh, being given the light for uh, uh, such a vision. Um, E.G. White herself says this in 3 SM 71 on this issue of prophets growing in understanding of things. For 60 years, I have been in communication with heavenly messengers and I have been constantly learning in reference to divine things, constantly learning and in reference to the way in which God is constantly working to bring souls from the era of their ways to the light in God's light. That is uh, Selected Messages, book three, page 71. And so she admits that also as she continued growing both in age and as she continued reading the scriptures, she also constantly learns. And so um, there is something that uh, was escaping my mind, but uh, it has come back. Uh, and this is in GC. In GC, Great Controversy. Great Controversy, page um, 163.3, going forward. Just to note that um, the carriers of the message never understood the message fully, and we can refuse to learn more from their writings because they themselves were never given that light, even though they wrote about the matter. And so, uh, talking about this man called Charles, he had deliberately rejected the truth presented by Luther and why I am firmly resolved to imitate the example of my ancestors, Lord the Monarch, D. Ogbin, uh, Ogbin uh, book 7, chapter 9. He had decided that he will not step out of the path of custom, even to walk in the ways of truth and righteousness. Because his fathers did, because his fathers did he will uphold the past purpose with all its cruelty and corruption. Thus he took his position, refusing to accept any light in advance of what his fathers had received, 
or to perform any duty that they had not performed. There are many at the same at the present day thus clinging to the customs and tradition of their fathers. When the Lord sent them additional light, they refused to accept it because not having been granted to their fathers, it was not received by them. We are not placed where our fathers were. Consequently, our duties and responsibilities are not the same as theirs. We shall be approved, we shall not be approved of God in looking to the example of our fathers to determine our duty instead of searching the word of truth for ourselves. Our responsibility is greater than was that of our ancestors. We are accountable for the light which they received and which was handed down as an inheritance for us. And we are accountable also for the additional light which is now shining upon us from the word of God. And so we cannot say as Adventists because the pioneers believed that and because the messenger was among them and they believed that there is no improvement or uh, additional light on the subject that uh, the, they, they had. And so we should be cautious about um, presuming that uh, uh, the prophets and the messengers of the Lord, both canonical and canonical, understood what they wrote. And so uh, we must consider the time and place. And she says about the testimonies, consider time and place. Nothing is to be cast aside. Look at the immediate context. Both in, We are talking about the Bible and how to look at E.G. White materials. In both cases, consider time and place. Look at the immediate context. And then look, study the larger context. Look for the principles. Maybe what she taught at that time, like... Uh, no buying of the bicycles, it's not prohibited for us right now. But the principle was that if these things are for leisure and pleasure seeking, that is the principle, do not do them. But we cannot take the specific, no one should buy the bicycle. Take into account her use of the scripture and uh, taking into account the use of her scripture. Um, even look at the issue of begotten. The word begotten. Begotten, it is used three times to Jesus Christ. That is um, his uh, birth, his resurrection, and his coronation. And so you have three different uses of the word begotten. Take into account her use of the scriptures. Sometimes you may find that uh, E.G. White speaks about something and quotes the scripture, and you wonder how could she quote such and such a scripture. And sometimes that is used as a theological um, a statement when in the real context, it may not be a theological statement, but uh, an amplification of the statement that uh, she is saying. And uh, uh, now, those are the things that... Um, uh, we 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 have to look at while uh, we are looking at uh, the materials both in the uh the materials both in the bible and in uh the writings of uh e. G. white and then uh, uh think about this uh, i just want to read one statement here in the uh, we we close up the way we should understand the Bible and the way we should understand E.G. White materials. How do we interpret these things? Uh, and uh, the statement I want to read is this. In, uh, in 1SM 39.3, 1SM 39.3, this is what she says. There are times when common things must be stated, common thoughts must occupy the mind, common letters must be written, and information given that has passed from one to another of the workers. Such a words, such a information are not given under the special inspiration of the Spirit of God. Because, you know, we are in danger of uh, saying that everything that comes from the mouth of the prophet is inspired. And so, 
somebody picks us up a statement in um, the diary or biography, Ijiwa did this and Ijiwa did this. And then we said, because this is a prophet, then she was inspired to do this. And uh, uh, she was righteous in this, when actually in the real sense, she was not righteous in that. And I can go deeply in these matters, even uh, her life with the husband, but it is not necessary to do that right now. Uh, we are just looking how do we interpret the Bible and how do we interpret uh, uh, the non-canonical, both canonical and non-canonical writers. There, there is some issues where she had to respond to the husband and all that and stuff. And uh, she herself came to uh, regret that she had even done that. And so sometimes we think that she is inspired to respond like that and to act like she acted or this person was uh, okay in doing that. We have even an example of uh, Moses not uh, circumcising the, the, the children and he was about to be killed because he, has, he had neglected. If that incident could have not happened, then somebody could just think because Moses had a duty uh, to go and save the children of Israel from Egypt, then what he did, everything he did was righteous and uh, killing the Egyptian and uh, leaving the child uncircumcised and all that because he's a prophet, everything is righteous. You even see Moses, when he was told to speak the stone, he hit the stone. And uh, if that incident could have not happened, people will say, oh, this is a prophet. And uh, there was no problem with that. But because there is a record of what happened after that, now we can know that uh, not always what the prophet does or speaks is inspired. And I have to give a disclaimer that... Uh, I'm not uh, belittling the prophets, both canonical and non-canonical. These are common things. These are common sense things, and uh, uh, we don't uh, we don't need to fear to talk about them. Think about Nathaniel. No, is it Nathaniel or uh, Nathan? I mean, when David desires to build the house of the Lord, and uh, Nathan tells him, "You go ahead and do that." But uh, a few hours. God tells him, go back to David and tell him, he has shed a lot of blood. He cannot build me a house. His son shall be able to build it. And so if God had not responded to Nathan, then you would think that Nathan was inspired to tell David to do what he desired to do. But all, also prophets can speak their mind. They can speak their own things and they are not inspired. And so we be just careful when we take everything that has happened with the messengers and say, oh, because this was a person called in the office of uh, a messenger or a prophet, everything they say is uh, truth. And so she herself, I repeat, says this. There are times when common things must be stated, common thoughts must occupy the mind, common letters must be written, and information given that has passed from one such from one to another of the workers. Such a word, such a information are not given under the special inspiration of the Spirit of God. Questions are asked at times that are not upon religious subjects at all, and these questions must be answered. We converse about houses, lands, trades to be made, and locations for our institution, their advantages and disadvantages. So you, you find that, um, oh, somebody says that, uh, E.G. built a house here and there, and it was looking like this. And we think that because she was a prophet, she must have had a knowledge of how houses should be built and where they should be built. She did such and such a business. And we think that because she is a prophet, then the right business to do is this and this. Brothers and sisters, we lack uh, sometimes common sense in dealing with things. And sometimes when you hear brethren defending some things about this prophet did this and this, this thing, E.G. White did this and this. You just marvel. You, you wonder why pe if people have been robbed of their reason or what is happening. Common things can be stated. And then you have this extreme end that, um, oh, E.G. White said this and it didn't happen. Or E.G. White said that the, in a certain house there were certain rooms, but it didn't have that. She said that once I was uh, in some place and this happens in a vision, but it has not happened. And so... There's another extreme that, oh, now look, 
this is a false prophet because this and this did not happen when the room was confirmed when the house was confirmed it was found with certain rooms and not what she said and so we can't even accept this is a true prophet there is always this issue of running from one opposite to another opposite it seems that people in these last days do not have balanced mind balanced mind and so they run from one extreme to another we should have balanced mind when approaching the issues to do with religion lest we become fanatics of what we are propagating and then uh, th there are others look at think about this statement that that um, the child's first teacher for the eight or nine years is the mother and you will find brothers seated in the church and they say you know it is not the work of the fathers to take care of the children. It's the work of the mother from zero years to eight and nine years. And you just like, uh, so the child is having a single parent. You ask yourself, what kind of reasoning is this? You mean the prophet has exempted the father from taking care of his own child for eight good years. And so what? Who is to teach this child? spiritual matters and what does eg white even mean when she says the mother the, the child's first teacher is the mother between zero to eight and nine years how do we understand such a statement are we to run off from the house as fathers and say that you know what if i stay in that house i'll interfere with the, the statement that the child's first teacher should be the mother and so how do we understand the writings of eg white and uh, how do we use them in a larger context? And what does she mean? Whom was she writing to? And for what purpose was she writing unto? This was a negligence that was happening and she had to write such a statement. And we have to look at such a negl negligence even if they exist today. And uh, understanding our roles as even parents. By the way, she says that... Uh, upon fathers and mothers is given the responsibility of bringing up the child for the kingdom of God. When she's commanding on uh, train up a child the way it should go and the child will never forget uh, the thing or that way. And she says that we are stewards and God has given us the children so that we may bring them for him and present them in, the, uh, in heaven. And then Jeremiah 13, 20 says that uh, look in the north, the people coming from the north, where is the little flock that was given unto the end? Who is being asked? It is not the mother being asked. It is both the parents who are being asked. So if you say that, oh, here is a statement by Ijiwa that the, 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 the teacher of the child should be a mother from zero to nine years. And then uh, you neglect as a father. Take care of your children. What, what, what kind of parenting is that? What kind of responsibility is that? And so uh, we ought to understand E.G. White in context and um, in a larger context. And uh, we should never forget time and place matter so much in her writing. And... Uh, uh, immediate context and larger context and then deriving the principles not taking the specifics maybe she wrote something specific to a certain person but what you have just to do is take the principle that is in that and then take account her use of the scriptures how has she used the scripture is it in a, a theolog uh, theological context or a, a homiletical context or um exegetical uh, uh, context. And so uh, this one I wanted us to read so that uh, we may not uh, say that uh, hang on the prophet and say she said this and this without understanding uh, uh, the context. Now, in uh, one of the things that they say that it was her failed vision, and I'll read this week we close. Uh, this is uh, in uh, 2 SG 208. At the conference, a very so this is this is in 1856. At the conference, a very solemn vision was given me. I saw that some of those present would be food for worms. Uh, 
some subjects for the seven last plagues and some will be translated to heaven at the second coming of Christ without seeing death. Sister Bonfey remarked to her sister as we left the meeting, I feel impressed that I am one that will soon be food for worms. And then the sister died, by the way, um, uh, soon. Now, <clears throat> still we are here and the people died. There have not been uh, the great time of trouble some food for worms and seven, some for seven last of plagues. And they, they point at this and say, look here, it's one of those prophecies that never got uh, fulfilled. And just so many things being pointed at. But then think about it. Paul talks about those who die and those who remain. And he counts himself as if that uh, when Christ comes, he'll be remaining. And... Uh, Many prophets talk about the nearness of events and uh, how they expected the imminent return of Jesus Christ in their time. And it didn't happen. And no one has ever been able to uh, give a shout on this canonical prophet that uh, they believed this and this and it didn't happen. So they are false prophet. We should discard the Bible. But here you meet a, a, a statement by her. And then uh, concerning the immediate context of uh, uh, what was happening at that time in 1856 and the push for uh, the, uh, the the Sunday laws and um, the wars that were happening at that time and how things were running so fast, the increase in spiritualism with the folk sisters and all uh, the rappings at that time. And it was shown that it was the highest, uh, uh, highest uh, uh, class of spiritualism. And uh, it pointed... Uh, almost toward or forward to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And then she had to make this statement because in her time, she understood that was uh, what the Lord was leading her. And she said that the Lord showed me. And so when she says that Lord showed me and it doesn't happen, what does it, was it a uh, uh, conditional prophecy or an unconditional prophecy if she was shown? And sometimes God will work because of the circumstances that are there and the response of the people will make God act in a way or another. You just look at the children of Israel in the wilderness journey. And so I just want to stop here. How do we interpret the Bible and how do we interpret E.G. White? These are very important things. And uh, we have to understand that um, they didn't have the totality of everything. As we continue growing closer to Christ, we understand even their writings more better. And the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophet, and the prophets will never bring in anything new. And I will touch on the issue of the God we worship, that uh, she stuck to the prophets that were before her. They knew about uh, the monotheistic God, and she stood to that. Having a background of uh, uh, polytheism or uh, as a Methodist and uh, a belief in tritheistic uh, 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 understanding of God. As a prophetess, she was led to monotheistic God. She built it upon other prophets. And so that is not my burden to prove such a doctrines and all that, but um, uh, may the Lord bless us and uh, let us always uh, know that um, when we are talking about uh, non-call and non-canonical writers, we should have this in mind. Consider time and place. Look at the immediate context and study the larger context and look for principles, not specifics, because you may go into specifics and then it becomes a very, uh, 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 um, uh, very, very, very difficult issue to handle. Take into account her use of the scriptures or any non canonical writer, their context, and uh, uh, the Lord will bless us. Otherwise, may we continue growing into truth and uh, we just pray that the Lord may not withhold from us that which is special for our time in this time. And he shall continue guiding us into all truth. May we be blessed this Sabbath and uh, shall we pray to end this. Gracious Lord, we thank you because
the messengers are means to the end and they are not the end to the means. And so we pray that uh, we may be open to listen to the voice of the Spirit. And we know that you shall not guide us into something that is very mysterious to what is revealed in the Scriptures. We know that uh, the Spirit shall guide us into all truth. And even though these people wrote things that uh, they may have understood according to their time, Lord, there comes a time we have to understand them without manipulating them how they apply to our time. Bless us this Sabbath and speak to us as individuals, as families, and as a church. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And uh, may the Lord bless you this Sabbath and let us continue learning together in this series of the prophets. Bye for now.